Ah, oh, it gives me great pleasure when I have to pull this up a wee bit. <laughs> it's great to see everybody this morning. Um, my topic this morning is following Jesus or discipleship. And it's so, so often in, in, uh, when you set out like this, you kind of start as if like everybody knows nothing. And uh, let me just tell you everything about being a disciple. And I was just like reflecting that it's really not like that at all. What I've got here is tens, fifties, hundreds of people that have been on a discipleship journey with Jesus for years. So in many ways, you could be up here um, talking and addressing this subject. And in fact, that's kind of what we want to do. That's what we want to do as a leadership. We want to hear your stories. We want to hear what Jesus has been saying to you and what it looks like for you to be a follower of Jesus. Um, the word, the New Testament word uh, for disciple, mathetes, is basically translated as adherent, student, learner, or follower, and that's probably the most common word that we would use uh, to be a disciple of Jesus. It's basically just a follower of Jesus, and a lot of you are here, and um, you're part of the life of St. John's Church because you want to be a follower of Jesus, because you are a follower of Jesus. In this journey series, uh, or as we go through the next year, year and a half, we're looking at the Gospel of John and the stories from there. So I'm just going to read the passage that I was given for this morning, and it's John chapter 1, verses 35 to 42. And it's just the very simple story of um, Jesus calling his disciples. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked to him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas or Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And then this is the... Um, Go, um, the passage in Matthew as well, it's similar. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. 
So from these passages this morning, I just wanted to pull out four or five different things that just kind of struck me about what it means to follow Jesus. The first is in verse 37, disciples follow Jesus. This relationship in your life becomes the primary relationship. We must make this relationship of communion with God and following Jesus primary above all else, above all, even our most closest and dearest relationships. Jesus calls us to make him the priority. Secondarily, from verse 39, disciples spend time with Jesus. You can't follow someone unless you're prepared to build a relationship with them and spend time with them. And for us, the discipleship in the everyday can look different, but it probably looks like something like slowing down to be with God, contemplation, maybe considering God in nature, or participating in worship. It could like, look like re-examining your rhythms of life. Now, as we've talked about this before, it's not prescriptive. These things should be unique to you, but it should look like things where sometimes you're on your own and sometimes you join with church family, but you have considered rhythms that you have proximity and relationship to Jesus. And the other thing about spending time is that you observe and you watch and you listen and you learn. And that's something historically I've been very bad at. I'm very much an activist, somebody that wants to go on and doing things. And I'm learning in the second half of my life what it looks like and how important it is for me to sit at the feet of Jesus and for me to listen and for me to observe and for me to learn. So disciples follow Jesus, disciples spend time with Jesus, but also from verse 41, disciples gossip about Jesus. And as Christians and as followers of Jesus, we're compelled to share our life with God, with other people. As we heard from the passage in Matthew, to fish for people, as Jesus said to Peter and Andrew, it's not an additional extra. It's something that we're compelled to do because of our love for God, our love for Jesus, to want to share um, who he is with other people. Verse 48 talks about the fact that disciples are known by Jesus. Jesus knew all about Nathaniel, and it gives us all great comfort to know that we are known. Loneliness is one of the biggest causes of mental health in our country this year. It's been tragic seeing a lot of what has come out from the pandemic. It's incredibly life-given to know that you are known. And I want everyone here to feel known by each other, but primarily to feel known and loved and cherished by God. And that's what God is offering you as a disciple and as a follower. Disciples are named by Jesus. More than Jesus just knowing you, Jesus names you. He named Simon Peter. You will no longer be called Simon, you'll be called Peter. Jesus gave Simon a new identity. From then on, he was going to be the rock that Jesus built his church on. And God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit wants to give each and every one of you a new identity, a new sense of purpose, a new sense of belonging. And like I said at the beginning, for most of us, it's not like just starting right now. It probably started a long time ago. And you know somewhat what it is to be a disciple of Jesus. But I really believe in this season that our church family is in, that our community in, is in, there is a real opportunity as for us to really lean in to what it looks like to really follow Jesus, to really commit 
wholeheartedly, our whole life to it. Not just a little bit, not just the odd day here or there, but a real rhythm of life that, <laughs> that brings Jesus right into the center and that we live from that place. And finally, disciples demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit. And this is the passage from Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have been crucified the flesh, who have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So the whole idea here is that if you are following Jesus, if you're spending time with him, if you're on proximity with him, you should notice that you're changing. As the reflection said earlier, and I just have a very similar passage I want to read in a little, a little minute, it's not so much about assenting to head knowledge. It's about taking that head knowledge and really working it into your life and seeing God bring about change. So as you grow in your discipleship with Jesus, as you grow in following Jesus, you should have more um, love in your life, more joy, more peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, all these things should be bubbling up because of the work that Jesus is doing in you. Here's another Richard Rohr quote from Divine Dance. Do you ever wonder why Western atheism is on the rise? Why does the Christian West by far produce the highest number of atheists? What I believe and have dedicated my life to reversing is that we have not moved doctrine and dogma to the level of inner experience. We've not moved doctrine and dogma to the level of inner experience. As long as received teaching doesn't become experiential knowledge, we're going to continue creating a high quantity of disillusioned ex-believers. Or on the flip side, we'll manufacture very rigid believers who simply hold on to doctrines in very dry, dead ways with nothing going on inside. And so we have two big groups on the landscape today. Those who throw out the baby with the bathwater, many liberals and academics, and those who seem to have drowned in the bathwater, many conservatives and fundamentalists. How about allowing the bathwater to keep flowing over you and through you? It is anyway, but we can considerably help the process by gradually opening up the water faucets, both cold, the cold and the hot. So what he's saying here is, it needs to be experienced. It needs to be lived. The relationship with Jesus can't just be a theory. It has to be something that we practically live and something that changes us. We need to grow more to live in relationship with Jesus and follow him, not just with our minds, but in all areas of our life. For me personally, I think I'm just starting to really understand and experience what this looks like. I'm learning what it means to live in the flow of the Trinity. Through the love, grace, and creative force of God the Father, the work and example of the Son, and the power and the witness of the Spirit, we live in the flow of God. We are welcomed into relationship with them. We are called to follow them. This is not just an intellectual exercise. This is not just a salvation story or life raft for the next life. This is following Jesus in 2024. This is experiencing God in 2024. An example for this for me, just as I finish, is I'm finding myself caught up in something way bigger than myself. I love what God is doing in this community. I love that God has brought Liam 
the minister at St. Michael's, and Rosie, the minister at St. Peter's, to be part of what God is doing in our community through them and their church projects and their community projects. They are God followers. They're disciples of Jesus. They are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. I love what God is doing with the Low Port Project. My friend Scott Brennan was round the building on Friday last week, and he talked about the Low Port Center being like a village of God. I asked him, what is a village of God? He said, it's where God was at the center of community life, accommodation, meals, commerce, charity endeavors, proximity, a place where we can experience and observe the kingdom of God in action. I can tell you this morning that the partnership center is full. There is a gym up and running, started on Monday, an upcycling and refurbishing furniture business, a science lab, a spec savers worship, and our own new well is taking up residence soon. This week, Andy signed up the last unit, which was a first step unit, that first step took on to run a food pantry in the building. And I found that incredibly exciting because I've been praying about that for a long, long time, that the building would be a place where everybody can come and people that have all kind of needs can come regularly, day by day, week by week. I'm so excited to help people meet their physical, emotional, and spiritual needs. But like I said at the beginning, I'm excited to hear your stories about what's happening in your workplaces, in your communities, with your families, with your friends. And yes, come and join with the Lowport Project. It's really exciting. But you're called to follow Jesus where you're at day by day. And I'm excited about learning what this can look like as we do this together. Let's just pray. God, I'm so thankful this morning for you. I'm thank you, I thank you for all that you mean to us, all that you have done for us. I thank you that you want to be real to us in a very day-to-day -day way. You want to reveal yourself to us. You want us to be able to experience you. Thank you for all the people in here that have lots of stories of how that has happened for them over many, many years. And God, I just pray that you would fill us more, God, as we move into the Lowport Center. Show us what it looks like to really be people of God who just live every day for other people, who live beyond themselves, who are known as people who are different, people who are following Jesus. God, help us to have courage. Help us to have boldness. Help us to have faith. Thank you for giving us the faith to get to this stage, God, to get to the stage where we can walk in the building. But to be honest, we're just getting started. To be honest, the journey is ahead of us. And so I just pray that you would help us and encourage us and show us what it looks like for us to get our strength and our courage from our proximity with you and our relationship with you. Show us what it looks like to follow Jesus in 2024. Amen.